Good morning, Pastor Mark. I understand you can prove Christ's birth through the scripture. Yes, the scripture, I believe, plainly tells us when he was born. Can you show us? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, one of the exciting things concerning the birth of Christ is birthday parties. Everybody loves birthday parties. And believe me, the father wanted to throw a huge birthday party for his son. And so what do we find? Uh, in Deuteronomy 16:16, 16, 16, uh, the Lord said that three times a year he wanted his people to gather in Jerusalem. He wanted them to gather there for the Feast of Tabernacles, for the Feast of Passover, and for the Feast of Pentecost. Why? Because uh, the father wanted everyone to see uh, when the Lord was born. He wanted them there for the birthday party. He also wanted everyone there to witness his son's death on Passover. And he wanted everyone there to witness the Holy Spirit being poured out on the Feast of Pentecost. We know God is a God of order. And uh, Josephus recorded that over two and a half million Jews would be in Jerusalem during the time of Messiah. So talk about a huge birthday party. The Lord wanted everyone there to see him born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now how can we prove that from the calendar? Well, let's start with the book of Luke, chapter 1, and we're going to talk about the birth of John the Baptist, actually, because that's our starting point. We find that John the Baptist's father, Zacharias, in Luke 1, 5 through 9, says that he was of the course of Abijah. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, that comes from 1 Chronicles 24. We find the course of Abijah was the eighth course. Now, what in the world does all that mean? Well, David, King David, divided the priesthood into different courses and they would each minister two weeks out of the year. And then during those three festivals, when everyone was there, they all the priests would minister together. And so uh, here is a picture of a huge crowd at uh, the Western Wall in Israel. And this is what it would be like. It would be jam-packed during those festival times. And if you look at this calendar here, because uh, Passover, as everyone knows, is in the first month of their religious calendar. We find the first week, and it's roughly is in our April, the first course would be the first week of April. The second course would be the second week of April. The third course is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a week-long feast, and so all the priests would minister. That being the case, everyone would minister there, and then the people that served the third course would serve the fourth week. The fourth course would fill, come in here. This would be the fifth, sixth, seventh. The eighth course was the course of Abijah. So Zechariah would have been ministering that eighth week. But guess what happens? The very next week, everyone would serve for the Feast of Pentecost. That is why you find in Luke 1, 10, 11, the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. The whole multitude was there for the Feast of Pentecost. And what do we find in Luke 1, 24? It says, after he finished his course, which would have been in here, uh, in the, this, the end of June, is when Elizabeth conceived, it says in the scriptures, and she hid herself five months. So from the end of June, if you count five months, July, August, September, October, November. So we're in the end of November is when this scripture comes to. And then we find in Luke 1, 26, it was in the sixth month, which would have been the end of December, that the angel appears to Mary and tells her that is the sixth month with Elizabeth, and this is when Mary conceives. So if Mary conceives in the end of December, as we know, a baby takes nine months. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The end of September, the first of October is the birth of Messiah. Hi, welcome back to part two. So, Pastor Mark, um, that's really something different uh, than I've been taught in the past that Christ was born, you're saying, at the end of September, early October? Yes. And that's exactly when the Feast of Tabernacles falls. And like I said, it was a party. Two and a half million people are there. God wanted them all there for the fun. And now I'm going to tell you how God had planned for the party from ages past. Uh, let's start with Deuteronomy chapter 16, uh, what, verse 14. One of the main aspects of the holiday of Sukkot, another name for the Feast of Tabernacles, is a commandment. Can you imagine? A commandment. And this is what God commanded. You shall rejoice in your feast. This is Deuteronomy 16, 14. God's saying, no whiny whinies. Everyone has to rejoice on my son's birthday. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, 14 goes on to say, you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, the widow that are with you in your gates, all of them have to rejoice during the Feast of Tabernacles. One of the interesting things is what's called the Hallel. 
what the Hallel is, it's Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. These Psalms were always sung during those feasts, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Well, Psalms 118 was one of the main Psalms that they would sing. And let's look at what they're singing during the Feast of Tabernacles. Psalms 118, verse 14, 15, and let's look at verse 21. Remember, they were commanded to rejoice. God is saying there will be a party on my son's birthday and you will rejoice. <clears throat> it says, the Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation. Now the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua. That was Jesus' Hebrew name. Mary didn't know English. And it says the voice of rejoicing and salvation or Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will praise you for you have heard me and you have become my salvation or my Yeshua on the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 24, Psalms 118 says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. Now, let's, with that in mind, how we have to rejoice, and we see the rejoicing that was going on, even here in the temple. Here's a great picture of all the big, they would stay up all night and party. Let's look now at Luke chapter 2, verse 8 and 11. What do we find here? It says, there were shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of what? Great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. <clears throat> now also, look at Luke 2.13. It says this, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So what do we find here? They were all rejoicing at the amazing timing of God. And what do we see here? This is Jerusalem in the winter when it is going to be snowing or possibly heavy rains. You are not going to find shepherds in the field with their sheep during the middle of winter. Thank Welcome you. back for part three. Wow, this is really exciting. What a party God threw for his son. So, how long does this party last? Oh, this is awesome. The party lasted eight days. Eight full days of partying all day and all night. Uh, as a matter of fact, what happened, because there were so many Jews in Jerusalem, uh, like I said, Josephus, a historian, said over two and a half million Jews from all around the, the countries around Israel would come for these feasts. And so there would literally be like thousands of these little sukkahs, is what they were called, little temporary huts that they would build and they would stay in the huts. So all over the Mount of Olives, all over Jerusalem, there'd be thousands of these little man-made sukkahs built that people would be sleeping in for the eight days. And what's amazing is in John 1.14, it says the word of God was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt there in the Greek, if you look it up, it's Strong's number 4637. It means skenu, and it literally means to tent or to tabernacle. So it says the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us on the Feast of Tabernacles, just as God did in the tabernacle of old. And when did they begin to build Moses' tabernacle? on the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll find that in the book of Exodus. And what's amazing to me also is in Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. It says, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. And uh, it says, because there was no room in the inn. Now, why was there no room in the inn? Because there were two and a half million people in Jerusalem. And uh, that's why there was no room in the inn. Anyway, they were all staying in sukkahs. Now, the other thing I want to bring out, it says they wrapped them in swaddling clothes. Uh, during this time, they would have these big lampstands. There was four of them in the temple. And guess what they used for wicks? 
they use worn out priestly garments for wicks. And if you look up the word swaddling clothes in the Greek, it's Strong's number 4683, and it means to wrap with strips. So what do we find? Yeshua, during the Feast of Tabernacles, was wrapped literally in priestly garments. If you do remember, his relatives were priests. Finally, what else do we see here? In Luke 2, verse 21, it says, When eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Yeshua, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now we remember the Feast of Tabernacles is eight days long. And it so happens if he was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, on the eighth day, where is he? He's in the temple, shedding his blood, confirming the covenant to Abraham. Isn't that phenomenal? Only God could arrange that kind of timing. Thank you. So, Pastor Mark, I can see the relevance for a Christian regarding the feast, but I've always been taught that these feasts were for the Jews. I can see how the New Testament complements the Old Testament now. So actually, it should be more like first and second book instead of New and Old Testament. Exactly, exactly. One thing that's really important to understand, and you find this in Leviticus 23, verse 1, it talks about how these are the feasts of the Lord. It doesn't say the, the feasts of Israel. It doesn't say the feasts of the Jews. It says these are the feasts of the Lord. Uh, then it goes on to say, even these, the Lord says, these are my feasts. So these belong to the Lord. And if you belong to the Lord, these feasts belong to you. Uh, an interesting thing about the word feast in Hebrew, the, the word is moed. Uh, the problem is when we hear feast, we think of what? Food. But the word moed literally means a divine appointment. And so these feasts were divine appointments from the Lord. They were appointed days that he had predetermined in history for his son to be born, for his son to die, for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. And one of the exciting things concerning that is, let's go back to the Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. We've already been showing how the Lord was born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, we saw that it was uh, eight days long. And then we find almost a month later, literally, is when uh, Mary and Joseph came back with the Lord uh, to do some sacrifices. And let's take a look at that. In Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 24, it says, When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Well, what's interesting is when you go to the law of the Lord, since they did it according to that, let's find out what really was supposed to be offered. In Leviticus 12, verse 6, uh, and we're going to go through verse 8, 8. We'll skip around a little bit here in, within those verses. But it talks about uh, a woman giving birth to a male child. And it says, When the days of her purifying are fulfilled, for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year, for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a young turtle dove, for a sin offering under the door of the tabernacle of the congregation under the priest. And if she's not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. So what do we find here? If, if the person was too poor, they couldn't afford a lamb, then they were allowed to bring two pigeons or two turtle doves. So when the New Testament tells us she brought uh, two turtle doves or two young pigeons, that tells us they were a poor family. They could not afford the lamb. Uh, mind you, that also tells you, since this was a month later, uh, the kings with their gifts didn't arrive at his birthday uh, when he was born. They didn't arrive for a couple of years later. But it, regardless of that, this is what is important. Here, she was thinking she was too, too poor and couldn't afford a lamb. Well, what do we find out? She did have a lamb of the first year. She had the lamb of God. Amen. Isn't that great? Want more? Listen to what's next.